So I think one of the things that uh, this other alternative that you're presenting, the kind of philosophy that you think is, is much more productive, and much more like a science. Uh, so you, you do say that philosophy is a science, it's a kind of science, and the thought experiment is a is part of this. Do you want to say something about why you say it's a science yeah. uh, and, and how important the, the thought experiment is to actually show that? Yeah. So when I say it's a science, I, I, I'm, I'm using science in a fairly broad uh, sense to, to cover um, sort of systematic, um, rigorous kinds of uh, inquiry um, you know, into fairly general um, matters. Um, so, you know, for me, um, a science isn't just something like um, physics, chemistry, biology that's based on ex experiments. Uh, mathematics is also a science, even though mathematics uh, it, it does not involve uh, experimentation. Um, so, you know, and I think in common with, with other sorts of uh, science, we, I mean, philosophy does put forward theories which may be true or may be false and what we have to do is to try to find out uh, which and uh, and one of the, one of the ways uh, in which we can do that is um, by uh, thought experiments um, thought experiments aren't only used by philosophers I mean, they're, they're used by scientists I mean natural scientists as well and Galileo and Einstein were famous for their thought experiments um, but just to give an example of the, the kind of uh, thought experiment um, that has been very influential in, in philosophy. Um, so there's, there's an old hypothesis about what knowledge is, which is basically that knowledge is just a, a to know something is just to have a true belief that is kind of reasonable in some sense. Uh, and th I mean, that's an idea which, which in, in some form goes back to uh, to Plato, um, and and this this idea was uh, basically uh, refuted by a kind of uh, thought experiment uh, that was was done by a, a guy called uh, Edmund Gaudier in the early nineteen sixties, uh, where what he did was to produce an example of um, a. I mean, a hypothetical example of of a, a reasonable true belief that was clearly not knowledge. And actually, in fact, although he did this in the nineteen sixties, it turns out that um, there were similar cases which um, Indian philosophers um, had been aware of more than a thousand years before. Which, and I think, as far as I can tell, I mean, I'm not a specialist in that area, but they, I think, they were using them to make pretty similar. Points and in, actually, their examples are better than Gettier's because they're kind of more natural stories. So, just to give you uh, a, an example, um, w w one of them involves you have to imagine that that you've got this person who's going along and um, he he sees what looks like uh, a a cloud of uh, smoke um, in the in the distance and. Uh, and so he he forms a um, a, a belief uh, that, that that there's uh, since there's no smoke without fire that there's that there's a fire over there and and so that's a pretty reasonable belief and uh, in the story it, his belief is true because there is a fire over there but what what's actually going on is. That this fire um, over there, it, it's not it's not smoking, but some, some the person who's made the fire um, is is cooking some meat, and the the smell of the cooking meat has drawn a whole cloud of flies, and so what what the guy has actually seen is a cloud of flies, which he's mistaken for a, a cloud of smoke, and um, and so I, you know I think the the. the the sort of natural judgment to make is, look, he doesn't know that there's a fire over there because because he's he's messing up um, and he's it, it's it's all resting on a mistake, even though he has a reasonable belief that there's a fire over there and the belief is true and um, so that's it's a kind of thought experiment because we're um, we've got to imagine this uh, scenario 
Um, and, and then we make a, a judgment about it, that the judgment is that this guy doesn't know that there's a fire over there, even though he has a reasonable true belief that there's a fire over there. And, and so that's, that's how you can use a thought experiment to, to produce a counterexample to what many people have thought was a, a great theory about the nature of knowledge. Yeah, and this raises the issue of what, something that the experimental philosophers have asked, um, whether the armchair uh, philosopher sitting there thinking of these things is not got bringing in his own personal or own personal prejudices <coughs> in that if you test out intuitions with different groups, women or non-white people or non-professors of philosophy, <laughs> they'd come up with something different. And Stephen Stitch and that lot have, have done... Where are we with that at the moment? Because it's shifting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so the first thing I w just want to emphasise about thought experiments is that there, there's nothing very weird about them. Um, and they're, they're not really very different from a whole lot of common sense um, knowledge of a, of a not particularly philosophical kind. So, for example, here's something that I, I know. Um, I know that if I were to start reading a, a textbook of accountancy out loud to my wife, she would tell me to shut up. Um, you know, and I know that because you know I haven't tried it out on her, but I, but I can I can imagine um, that that's how, what her reaction would be, and there's really no doubt that that that, that is what it would be. So you know, that's just an example where we can we can use our imaginations, but not just in a kind of having a wild fantasy sense, but in the sense of actually using them to think through what would happen in certain circumstances. And, uh, and, that's, and that's really what is, is happening with these philosophical thought experiments, except that the, the scenarios involved are ones that you know, are chosen because, they, because they're challenging for some philosophical theory. Now, w what Richard was talking about was um, what um, some philosophers did around about two, 2000 was they started trying out these philosophical thought experiments on uh, people who were not professional philosophers. And um, at first they got results which suggested that, that, that there were big variations um, in what answers people gave to these questions, like, does the guy know that there's a fire over there, which depended on... Um, well, so, to some extent on ethnicity, I mean, that supposedly East Asians were giving different answers um, from, from um, Westerners and, and also uh, variation from, between men and, and women and so on. And so the, the critique that these uh, so-called experimental philosophers were mounting of the method of thought experiments was that it was actually based on um, just assuming that, that white males are typical of all human beings and, and white males from, from, the, from the West. And, um, and so, the, you know, the, the, so, so there was a lot of excitement for um, a decade or so about this uh, critique. But um, more recently, things have, have changed because, I, I mean, initially the, these experiments were done by philosophers, you know, who were sort of doing amateur psychology, but they weren't really, tr they weren't trained to do these experiments. And, um, and psychologists know that there are all kinds of pitfalls with experiments that wouldn't really occur to philosophers. Um, so, I mean, one that may actually have been relevant to the, 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 the results that they originally got is that if you, if you ask people questions which they don't really feel very motivated to answer, I mean, basically where they're not very interested, then their answers tend to be closer to random because they don't, don't care, so they just sort of say any old thing to as an answer, whereas people who are interested in the question um, be, you know, take more care. So, um, and, and people, the philosophers hadn't been controlling for that kind of effect, but more recently, I think, you know, the philosophers have, well, to some extent, they've learned more psychology, and they've also had more collaborations with psychologists. Um, and 
sort of using the, the psychologist's superior knowledge of you know, how to do experiments properly and, and what are all the things that can go wrong with an experiment. And since, since they've been doing these experiments uh, more carefully, uh, most of these um, gender and ethnic uh, differences have just disappeared. It, don't, it turns out that actually um, reactions to these so-called Gettier cases, like the one I was describing, are they're, they're pretty much universal um, amongst uh, human groups, you know, irrespective of ethnicity and irrespective of gender. I mean, they've, they've tried them out on lots of different groups, and on men and women, and, and it, it, increasingly it's, it's looking um, as, as though most of these experiments are drawing on things that are maybe even to a, a surprising extent kind of human universals. And, I mean, there are some, a few cases where it's not like that, but, but, but they're there there are independent reasons for thinking that, that they're, they're not really well-constructed experiments because they're, they're too much asking people to, to you know, answer theoretical uh, questions, or they're using the, the questions are put in terms of terminology, which is theoretical, and so you can't, you can't necessarily expect that ordinary people will understand the, the the terms of the question in the same way that they used in professional philosophy, so they don't tell you anything about that. So, so you know, it, it, you know, in a way, it's just it's turning out that, you know, although this could have been something interesting about, you know, something problematic about philosophical method, in practice, it seems that uh, philosophy is is more universal, at least in in respect of these key thought experiments, than you might have thought.